as Pete says, it's a fantastic opportunity for us to, to come together and talk about something completely different to, um, to arthroplasty, the complete reverse, preserving the knee. And although, um, obviously, um, I've, I've mucked up the program by asking to go first, in fact, osteotomy should be first and should set the scene for, for the rest of the talks because alignment is everything. So um, I'd just like to thank uh, Rags, who's coming later on this afternoon, uh, my, my most recent fellow who's just been appointed at Guys and Tommies, um, and the other fellows and members of the research team, and also all the support that we get in Basingstoke from industry um, with our registries um, and with our, with our research. And it really is key um, to all the things that we're talking about. If we don't get the alignment right, um, uh, then uh, the other procedures that we do want to do the patients are, are much less likely to work. And we can do it to retention ligaments to improve function, but obviously most commonly we use it to unload damaged arthritic um, compartments of the knee. So in terms of the algorithm, um, wh where do we start? Um, and I, I mentioned at the, at the very start of my lecture that really getting the, getting the alignment right is the first, first part of, of putting the jigsaw puzzle together in terms of treating patients' problems. And um, this, I think, is also a Tim Spalding slide um, in terms of, of what we should do. So get the alignment right, think about the, uh, the instability issues and do the ligament reconstructions, deal with the meniscus, deal with the joint surface, and then um, obviously we need to rehab the patients. And that's um, from, from Vedonk. And at this slide from Roman Sale, the current ESCA president, often gets shown uh, by myself and, and, and others because it's such a, an important message. And probably the key message from the talk is this is where we want to keep our patients in the repair phase. We want to avoid the reconstruction and arthroplasty phase for as, for as long as possible. Our patients are living into their 80s. We know that, that joint replacements have limited lifespans and also the outcomes are unpredictable. And this is where we should be um, making the effort uh, to, to maintain patients in the repair <laughs> phase. So we know with meniscal surgery, um, we can excise or we can repair. Um, and we're gonna hear later on today um, from others about the, the options in terms of meniscal scaffolds and in terms of uh, meniscal allograft transplantation. Um, we also know that we can do things to the joint surface. We can, we can tidy them up, microfracture, we can actually replace with the patient's own tissue, or we can use these new allografts, uh, fresh frozen um, options that are available. And of course we have cartilage uh, uh, resurfacing uh, opportunities, and then we start to move into joint replacement. We have these new metal and plastic partial replacements, and then we have um, the, 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 re the, the replacements that we're all familiar with. So to try and make osteotomy work a bit better, because it, it, it can be a painful operation, um, and um, it it's, has always had, historically, a very bad reputation. And what we've been trying to do with this operation is we've brought it into, um, into its new form, is to make it as minimally invasive as possible and make the rehabilitation as quick as possible for the patients. And we've done this by uh, making smaller incisions. We now use a, a, a precision, what we call a precision bone wedge. We use these small plates and we use cryotherapy. And it is possible to use big and small plates through small incisions through an operation that can take 30 to, to 45 minutes in skilled hands. It's very important to have the correct equipment, and these are expensive. This striker um, saw blade, that the handpiece is expensive, the blades are, uh, are 200 pounds, but you can see how it's not cutting my glove. And particularly on the femur, you can use your finger as the homen at the back of the femur to protect the neurovascular structures, and you can have complete safety knowing that you're not gonna cause injury or harm because of this fantastic um, device from striker. We used to use these big incisions, extensile approaches, and in fact, Neil said that when he first started at Stanmore, one of the surgeons, Carl Nissen, used to just drive a sharp osteotome straight into the bone without making a skin incision, and, and that was how he carried out his uh, osteotomy. And we've moved on to this um, Hanover approach, this from Christian Clay, this minimally invasive approach. 
And in terms of the landmarks, um, obviously this is not beginner surgery. So with osteotomy, it's important that you become familiar with the technique. And as you gain in, uh, confidence, you start to move to this uh, to smaller and smaller incisions uh, into what you're comfortable with. So here I've marked out the back and the front of the of the tibia and the pes, and you can see the joint line above. Um, I'm then going to uh, mark out where I think I'm going to need to be in terms of getting the top of the plate and the bottom of the plate. So when we, we then obviously make our incision, we go down do a superficial MCL release, which is really very similar to what we do during knee replacements, and then we place our guide wires. And you can either place one if you've become very familiar with the technique, or initially uh, we teach our trainees to, to use two as a cutting platform for the saw. Again, just to sort of um, uh, reiterate that this is, I think, a, um, a key piece of equipment, and if you don't have it, Get it in, try it, and once you've once you've persuaded uh, your line manager that actually having a, a neurovascular injury is a, is is potentially expensive, this is something that I'm sure they'll agree uh, is is a device that you can have as part of your um, uh, armamentarium. We do a biplane cut, so that means we make the incision, the main horizontal incision, 70% um, of the way through the bone, um, or or 75%, or and then we make an angle of 110 degrees we make our ascending biplane cut. And we do this because we don't then have to worry about coming through the tendon. We have this lovely buttress of bone that will heal within the first three weeks and provide stability. And it really does, Alex Stalby's got some very nice work to show that. Um, and um, it also means that you only have this much of the, of the bone that actually needs to heal as part of your working osteotomy. So once we've mobilized the bone with the saw, uh, we can then finish, finish off the osteotomy. Um, and we very, very gently tap in the oste osteotomes. And in fact, at this stage, really you should be putting them in by hand. The, the osteotomy needs to be mobile, and you should really try and do that with the saw if you can. So we, we then came up with this concept of trying to use a laminar spreader without putting it inside the osteotomy gap. And this is obviously dying for an instrument to be made. Um, and the foot and ankle surgeons have something that's re reasonably useful for this. But you can see that by placing the laminar spreader onto the wires, it's not in the osteotomy gap, which means um, that we can uh, place our bone wedge very easily. Now, the question is whether or not we should fill the gap. Alex uh, Staubli, he had more than 500 cases up to 22 millimeters and he never put anything in the osteotomy ever and he never had a single non-union so the plates are designed to heal without um, any material foreign or bone being placed within the gap but there is a temptation from orthopedic surgeons to fill that gap we want to put something in it um, it always makes us feel better and in fact there's good reasons why you should so in Basing State what we decided to do was take our femoral heads from our bone bank um, and uh, use these to fashion uh, bone wedges. And we can make these wedges according, according to our digital planning, so we can make them slightly bigger at the back, slightly smaller at the front, to maintain a, trapezoid, to maintain a trapezoidal space so that the um, slope doesn't change. So we can actually use it as a tool to not only stop this from bleeding and act like a cork in a bottle, but also to, to um, provide its immediate stability um, and um, faster union. So in terms of placing the bone wedge, we use this sophisticated tool, and you can see how the laminar spreader is out of the way. Once the bone wedge is in, that's the operation done. So then you can take your wires out. You then have this window that you can work within to, to, to put your plate in. Um, and um, it, it's so much easier than having a laminar spreader at the back of the osteotomy and fighting with that for the rest of the case. So there are lots of different plates that you can use. This is the new clip um, Active Motion 2 plate, which we've been using. Um, they, I'm apparently, I'm a designer. I made a few comments um, uh, as a designer surgeon. But it's a, it's a, nice, it's a nice plate um, because it is actually stronger than Tomafix. So uh, it was tested by uh, Dietrich Pape. There's a, they're the go-to guys in Luxembourg. And Newclip took their plate there, and they've done it for eye balance, Tomafix, peak plate, and they've now done it for Newclip active motion. And actually, it, it's, it, it outperforms the Tomafix in terms of its strength. And Dietrich's about to publish that uh, paper. 
um, and it's obviously again facilitates a smaller incision and um, and it's uh, can be done MIS we then let the tourniquet down elevate the leg give tranexamic acid and then everyone is encouraged to have one of these obviously in the NHS you you have to try and sell it to the patient private patients tend to just you know be, be quite happy to rent one of these and I think this makes a huge difference to the outcome so here's a typical case and this is really a lot of this meeting is based around these types of patients. This referred in by another knee surgeon. Um, you can see a failing medial compartment, some patches of grade four. There's definitely some life left in the in this knee. And this guy's a very fit, athletic guy who wants to continue um, with his sport. He wants to continue to be active, and he's certainly not ready for any kind of knee replacement. And and what he's saying at the moment is, I haven't taken a paracetamol yet, and I, I don't understand why because of what you did to me. And I think that's a combination of um, the, the, the minimally invasive approach, the cryotherapy and the steps that I just sh took you through. Here's a grade 4 case, 42, he's got bilateral medial osteoarthritis and night pain um, and he had a double osteotomy uh, on one side, of this, this was a peak plate, on this side we did the deformity analysis and I didn't want him to be doing this at three weeks but he, you know, sometimes you get these patients, he was off his crutches when he came to see me um, and patients can perform um, uh, well early uh, with the, with this particular operation and actually his pain scores at a year were fantastic that he had a VAS score of, of nothing. Here's a bilateral simultaneous case that we did um, about 18 months ago um, at, at Basingstoke 47 if you look again he's he's varus he's got a he's got early um, degenerative changes um, on the arthroscopy we can see the failing compartment so on the left uh, we do um, a bone wedge MIS, on the right we do the same simultaneously uh, and this is the patient the next day we, we allow him to fully weight bear. We don't obviously encourage the patients um, not to do too much for the first couple of weeks but he was very comfortable and went out the door the next day. So this is a, a good friend of mine and the reason why I put it into, the, into this presentation is it shows that he, this is a knee surgeon, Mark um, uh, was looking after the um, uh, Indian cricket team for, for a number of years um, and this was his uh, picture he had a horrible uh, varus thrust um, and he wanted to get something done about it now he knows all the options and actually um, Pon Ponky uh, Freer had done an osteotomy on the other side which he was happy with but he wanted to have something a little less painful and uh, came up to Basingstoke for his osteotomy. And uh, when I did my follow-up at the Isikos meeting after five months, I said, how are you doing? And, and Mark did this and uh, smiled and he's had the plate out and he's absolutely delighted with his osteotomy. This is another a knee surgeon. This, this chap works in Jordan and he had this full thickness chondral defect, varus, um, and came up for um, cartilage surgery in combination with um, with a with an osteotomy, and again, very surprised that he'd had his knee opened, um, and he'd had the osteotomy, um, uh, and he was pain free the, the day following surgery. So we've 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 done a study looking at what what are these bone wedges doing. We've done one clinically. Uh, Twenty eight patients um, uh, were assessed in each arm, um, and when we looked at the at the mean VAS scores. Uh, the bone wedge patients did, did much better but what was really surprising to me was not the fact that there's much much less pain but actually the outcomes, at, this is a year actually, this, uh, this should say 12 months um, the uh, Oxford knee score and the COOS was just so much better in the bone wedge group and I, I, that was a surprise to me uh, and we, we, in, that, in that series we had um, no significant complications so we've done a biomechanical study with Dietrich Pape, as I say, he's the go-to guy for this, and um, uh, James Belsey is doing the PhD, and Roman and Dietrich um, have, have done the experiments already, and will will be um, uh, publishing that um, in the very near future, and, and not surprisingly, the bone wedge does provide um, uh, significant initial stability. So in Basingstoke, we've, we're close to a thousand osteotomies now, in terms of numbers, and we're following them all. Uh, our DFO series is 172. Uh, this is work that I've collected with, with Chris uh, Wilson from Cardiff and Matt Dawson from Carlisle and Mike um, Risebury and now Sam Yassen uh, are, are also carrying out cases in Basingstoke and between us we're following the cases and what we're seeing is uh, very similar results for our osteotomy patients to our partial knee replacements in terms of 
Oxford Knee School Coos and, uh, and Improvement in Pain. I'm just going to show one or two slides because we, we, we can also apply this MIS technique to the femur. This is again uh, from Hanover, this is Christian Clay's idea and actually through this window it is possible to do this operation very safely in terms of placing the wires, making the cuts, placing the second wire and creating a, a cage for the second cut um, and uh, you can see that the wires going in then doing again a biplane cut for the same reasons as, as I described earlier so cutting the bone two-thirds and then one-third ascending um, and then slipping the plate in and Christian came, in, came up with this really really clever idea and this is a really fantastic take-home tip and it's to use a passport cannula at the top um, for the top two screws in terms of putting your drill sleeves and putting your drill bits in it makes it so much easier to access the the plate because you have um, this cannula uh, it just makes it so easy to do that top part of the operation very similar in terms of what we do for post-op uh, in uh, pain and swelling um, so really osteotomy is all about keeping options open this is one of Neil's patients um, she had bilateral osteotomies in 95 um, she had an ACL with an MCL done in New York she had the right knee done in 2003, the left in 2004. She was a good friend of David Murray's, didn't want joint replacement at that stage in her life. So Neil then took her nearly 10 years later to bilateral simultaneous knee replacements, total and partial. And here she is, age 59, at six weeks, at an appropriate age for, um, for, for, for those joint replacements. Oh, that's running. So this is... These, this is just something slightly lighter, just two slides to finish with. This is to say that it works in the elderly. This is Professor Takuchi's uh, way of assessing his patients at three months. He's done this brilliant study on over 70 and under 70 uh, year old patients uh, undergoing osteotomy. It's a fantastic study that he's presented and uh, I believe about to publish on. This is another lady who is, who's had a, an osteotomy and this is her at two months, 81. It's just amazing. And look at this 87-year-old lady doing her rehab at, um, at three months. And it just makes the point that if, the, if, the, if it's appropriate, age really shouldn't come into the uh, equation in terms of osteotomy. So we're having our 10th master class in December. Um, we're going to do a live femur this time. We're going to do a distal femoral osteotomy um, to mix it up a bit. And um, you're all welcome to attend. And I'll take any questions. Thank you very much.